Welcome, as this session will focus on the benefits of nature on cognitive health, specifically looking at the work of Bratman and colleagues, the impacts of nature experience on human cognitive function and mental health. Biophilia, it's a term coined by the Harvard naturalist, Dr. Edward Owen Wilson, and he describes it as humanity's innate tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes and to be drawn toward nature, to feel an affinity for it, a love, a craving. So our objectives for this particular session are to focus on nature as defined by Kaplan. Does nature have an effect on our bodies? and what theories guide researchers. And as noted by Bratman and colleagues, nature, for the purposes of this review, is defined as areas containing elements of living systems that include plants and non-human animals across a range of scales and degrees of human management. From a smaller urban park, to relatively a pristine wilderness. In 1998, Evans and colleagues conducted a study and they estimate that the typical American now spends about nearly 90% of his or her life within buildings. And as Individuals across the country move into cities and indoors at an unprecedented rate. Individuals are faced with a rapid disconnection from the natural world. And this opens a suite of critical questions about repercussions for psychological well being. This is an interesting study published in June of 2011 called City Living and Urban Upbringing and their effects on neural social stress processing in humans. fMRI imaging, it measures brain activity by detecting changes associated with blood flow. When the area of the brain is in use, blood flow to that particular region also increases. Recent work using fMRI imaging has shown that urbanization may tax the neural mechanisms involved in dealing with stress. A restorative garden is a place where a person or a group of persons can go to simply sit and be, to rejuvenate and to feel better by being in harmony with nature. It can also be called a healing garden. Marcus and Barnes have conducted work on the history of healing gardens in hospital settings, and they trace the incorporation of restorative gardens back to the Middle Ages. The incorporation of nature into the estates of the rich is another example of the extent to which people have been willing to invest resources in aesthetically pleasing landscapes throughout history. The reasons for this may vary from a display of power and control over nature to a sense of peace and enlightenment that these landscapes create in the mind of the landowner. Attention restoration theory and stress reduction theory both assert that contact with nature should induce positive effects, either through the replenishment of directed attention or through the benefits of reduced stress. Thus, measurements of mood appear in studies that work within either of the theories as constructs. These are two instrumental theories guiding nature's effects on health stress reduction theory, and attention restoration theory.
Moreover, in a study by Berman and colleagues in 2008 focused on attention restoration theory, the authors noted the cognitive benefits of interacting with nature. Specifically, the authors tested subjects with a backward digit span task. It's a test that measures working memory. And after this test, the experimenters induced mental fatigue in the subjects with a 35 minute test that taxed memory and randomly sorted the participants into two groups. One group that walked through an urban setting and another group that walked through an arbor arboretum. Both walks were the same distance and the same amount of time, 2.8 miles for 50 to 55 minutes. Following this experience, either the urban setting or the arboretum, the participants performed the digit span backward task once again. Interestingly, the Arboretum group performed significantly better on the memory directed attention task than did the urban group. Moreover, in 2005, Berto conducted a study looking at solely natural images just pictures. Berto induced mental fatigue into subjects through a sustained attention response test called a SART. It's a five minute response control test that requires subjects to press a button when a rarely occurring target digit appears on a computer screen, but not when other digits appear. So it induced mental fatigue on these subjects. Berto then expose participants to pictures of natural scenery, restorative environments, or urban scenery, what he deemed as non-restorative environments. Those exposed to the natural pictures perform significantly better on the second administration of the sustained attention response test than did their con counterparts after exposure to the images. And Ulrich has conducted studies rel relative to stress reduction theory. Ulrich notes that emotions occur innately and in some state of constancy across cultures. He suggests that landscapes with views of water and or vegetation and that contain modest depth, complexity, and curvilinearity would have been most beneficial for survival. These landscapes, according to stress reduction theory, help to moderate and diminish states of arousal and negative thoughts within minutes through psychophysiological pathways. Within the Ulrich study and stress reduction theory, Uh, Ulrich instructed a group of mildly stressed participants to view sets of color slides. One group saw nature scenes with vegetation and trees predominating the visual field, while another group viewed city landscapes with little to no vegetation. Self-ratings of positive effect, including elation and affection, were greater in those subjects that viewed the natural vegetative scenery. Negative feelings such as fear were lower in the nature group as well. Additionally, urban viewers experienced increases in aggravation, anxiety, and feelings of sadness. Ulrich continued to his work and to further test this theory, Ulrich and colleagues ran an experiment in which 120 subjects watched a stressful, stressful movie for 10 minutes and then viewed scenes of six different types of settings, ranging from most urban to most natural for another 10 minutes. During this, 
subjects were monitored for levels of physiological stress through the measures of their heart rate, skin, conduct, skin conductance, muscle tension, and systolic blood pressure. Subjects were also asked to self-rate their affective states. All measures indicated significantly higher speed of recovery from stress when subjects were viewing nature scenes rather than viewing urban scenes. An interesting study by Park and colleagues in 2007 looked at the impact of forests versus urban landscapes on stress relief as he explored 12 subjects by transporting them between forest and city settings in Japan and measuring salivary cortisol concentration, diastolic blood pressure, and pulse rate while the subjects were physically present within each environment. All of these measures indicated significantly decreased stress for the participants after being present in the forests for only 15 minutes a result that was not found when they were placed in urban landscapes. <clears throat> According to attention restoration theory, there are four essential components that a landscape must contain to capture one's attention effortlessly and without directed effect. The first component is extent, the scope of the experience. One must feel immersed within the natural environment or how long this experience is. Moreover, the second component is a feeling of being away, specifically an escape from habitual activities and concerns of daily life. The third component is fascination. There must be an aspect of an environment that captures one's attention effortlessly and without any directed effort. One must become fascinated with the landscape. And the final component that a landscape must contain is this notion of compatibility. Frederick Law Olmsted is a famous champion of urban parks and of natural scenery. He denotes that these natural sceneries employs the mind without fatigue and exercises it, it tranquilizes it and enlivens it. And thus through the influence of the mind over the body, it gives the effect of refreshing rest and reinvigoration to our whole body. The Wilderness Act was passed in 1964, which was signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson. This act established the National Wilderness Preservation System and instructed federal and management agencies including the National Park Service, to manage wilderness areas and preserve wilderness character. Prior to closing, I just want to share a small piece on biophilic design as a whole evolution of engineering has evolved due to this focus on nature. Our job is to design more responsibly. Make the Garden City a true work of nature. We believe in biophilic design, so wherever possible, we bring that into our design. Biophilic design is essentially how we use design to cultivate the love of living things. It's to highlight the beautiful aspects of nature that people can fall in love with. My role is to bring nature into the indoors so that people are never quite detached from the outdoors. To me, it's a tool to see how you incorporate all these various natural elements in the building design so as to create an environment of wellness. The future of design is to think long term and the best way to do it as one well of the strategies is to integrate with nature. 
Hence, biofilic design is one of the best strategies out there. Imagine you have a site full of trees. If you add a building in there without eliminating the trees, you are bringing another aspect that was not originally there while maintaining the memories and the natural aspects of it. Biophilic design does improve productivity, especially in the creative industry. If you look at Solaris as an example, it is surrounded by nature. It has an atrium that brings in natural light. So there are ample opportunities for the workers to step out of office or look out the window. What we have here are all the uh, horizontal fins that also act as light shelves, uh, reflecting light all the way into the building. By doing that, uh, what happens is that there's a lot of natural daylight coming into this building uh, without, even without the lights on. So that, that's a benefit of uh, what biophilic design brings. Biophilic design does help improve the healing process, especially you know, ample ventilation like breezes and views. Natural light actually helps the body generate vitamin. Psychologically, it brings up the mood. When we did the design for this hospital, we thought, you know, why can't every patient have a window? So what we did is we reinvented the ward layout. By having it as a staggered ward layout, every patient now has a view out towards a very nice, beautiful garden. And in terms of the ventilation, you can have the wind moving through the walls because you have windows on both sides. And when you have the view out, you have the better ventilation, you have greenery, you actually aid in the healing process. The education setting, perfectly designed, also play an important role when people, and especially children, stimulated by the environment, the spirits are lifted and the attention is heightened. This is actually a very special school to me. Um, it is Victoria School. Instead of a very conventional courtyard, we actually designed the landscape to be uh, like an eco garden. We call it the eco street and we use it as a learning environment for the school itself. So students can immerse themselves and treat this as an outdoor science laboratory or more like an outdoor learning classroom. By incorporating biophilic design into schools, the school itself becomes a tool for learning, uh, an example uh, of indoors and outdoors and how it reacts to the environment. Biophilic design to me is about really going back to the roots we are really giving up a lot of our natural spaces. The only way to reclaim that back is to integrate that in the way we design in our buildings. For Singapore, that is the way forward. Imagine if every development um, is integrated with nature. So every new development regenerates nature. And uh, there's a kind of future we hope that we can contribute towards. Our objectives for this particular chaining were what is nature as defined by Kaplan? Does nature have an effect on our bodies? And what theories guide researchers? Thank you.